Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mainframe Summit, brought to you by 6.5 Media. I'm Daniel Newman, host of this segment, CEO of the Futurum Group, and I'm very excited for this opening keynote session, joined by my esteemed colleague and friend, Mr. Ross Morey, someone that I've spent, uh, what, about the past decade now working very closely with, and uh, very excited to have you be part of this introductory session, this opening session here at the Mainframe Summit. Thanks, Daniel. I, I'm, it's, it's, I'm really glad to be here with you. It's exciting times. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. And uh, yes, we go back a long way and uh, hopefully a long way into the future, which we're going to talk about. Yeah, you know, that's a really great starting point, Ross, is, you know, the mainframe has been one of those topics that people love to put sort of very finite wrappers around. The mainframe is going to be the most important piece of technology forever conversation we enjoy having. And then of course there's the, the you know, maybe those coming out of distributed cloud or out of cloud space that wanted to say over time the mainframe is going to fade. And we know that's not true. In fact, you and I talked about that years ago. And in fact, if anything, its role has become more and more important. But the importance of distributed cloud of hybrid has mm -hmm. grown. It's grown yes. at IBM, it's grown everywhere. Yes. I'd love to kind of get your perspective on this intersection and why the mainframe remains so important despite the fact that cloud has really realized a lot of the potential that we thought it had early on. I think um, when it comes down to computer science, there's always going to be multiple ways to get things done and there will be more cost effective ways to get things done. And so I think the mainframe paradigm, that massive scale up, powerful, secure platform for transactions and data is going to remain around for as long as I can see. But I also think that distributed computing and hybrid cloud is actually what clients are really expecting these days. They want to be able to find workloads where they fit the best. Does the workload fit the best in a scale out environment of a cloud or maybe just in the development environment of the cloud? Or, or do, for security reasons, do they want to keep everything under their own protection? I mean, clients, especially in regulated industries, have much different you know, wants and needs, demands, than I would say the average consumer. So my clients are the big enterprises of the world, the governments of the world, right? Uh, regulated industries uh, around the world. And I think the mainframe is going to be here for a long time. But what I love that's going on right now is through the use of open technologies, like Kubernetes, containers, things like that, we're really seeing this emergence of being able to have the mainframe communicate very well with any hyperscaler or other, other on-premises uh, clouds of other architectures or, with, or even with SaaS uh, providers that maybe provide that themselves, not in a hyperscaler. This is through the use of APIs and again, open technologies. And so I think our, my clients, for the most part, have in their mind, it's going to be a hybrid world. They want to make sure the mainframe plays its role and, and has data that can be shared securely if need be beyond its borders, which has always been something people want to get the data off the mainframe. We're now making it easy to be able to get your mainframe to where you need to. Um, but also, one of the things I would just wrap with here is, in a hybrid world, it's very interesting now, I'm starting to see a lot of repatriation of applications from a private cloud or the public cloud back onto the mainframe. And we can talk about why that is if you like. Yeah, I think that would be a great uh, follow up there, Ross, because really what I'm hearing is something that I've been saying for some time. And one is it's the what I call the and effect. Mm -hmm. See, every different compute architecture has certain capabilities and characteristics that make it the best at doing <laughs> a certain thing. And so while sometimes we want to kind of, you know, it's a pundit thing, oh, we're going to move everything here. It's like, no, you're not. You know, I remember, remember 10 years ago, it was like every workload was going to be in the public cloud. Right. It's like, no, it isn't. I mean, not only have we seen the mainframe grow in terms of its value and its, its, its use, we've seen that even with on-prem. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there was like, it, we're, it, the economics don't make sense. The, right. the scale doesn't make sense. The, you know, the, the geography and the compliance, and there's a lot of the same thing with the mainframe. So you, I, I want you to finish that thought now, but you were kind of going down that kind of, here's the reasons yeah. why. I think that um, what I'm seeing outside of, you know, regulatory requirements, let's, let's go right there, let's go outside that. What I'm seeing is, is that as these transaction systems grow, it's much more economical for the clients to just continue to modify them than to, to, than to try to recreate them in another architecture. And the clients that have tried to recreate them in, the, in other architectures, it's extraordinarily expensive and they don't necessarily get any benefits, including economic benefits, is what it's proven out to be. 
Now, my problem is that those clients that do those things that have massive failed projects don't want to talk about it public, publicly. So it's always in rumor, or maybe now and then someone will mention something about it publicly. We obviously can't talk about it. I can't talk about it as an IBM employee. But it's, it's a shame. But anyway, so why is the mainframe going to stick around even more? It's not just because it's got, you know, 250 billion lines of COBOL code running on it. Some of that COBOL code is going to leave the mainframe. More of it's going to be generated and run, right? I think that it's back to fit for purpose. And the, the things that run the best on the mainframe right now are these large transaction systems and large database systems. And the real, I think, the real twist that's happened in the last decade or so, and you've seen this, is now with Linux on the mainframe. Linux has been on the mainframe for 25 years. But in these last 10 years, we've seen growth like never before. And it's because of clients now running huge open source applications and databases on the mainframe as well, running under Linux. Super amount of consolidation going on. So things that made sense to move to a large Intel cluster or move into a hyperscaler, they're now being moved back en masse into large Linux clusters. We have clients today that have more than a million Linux MIPS. So MIPS is a capacity measure, and you know that for the mainframe. Single clients with more than a million Linux MIPS. What are they doing with all those MIPS? They're, they're consolidating thousands of databases of all different brands, both proprietary databases and open source. They're bringing on other workloads, whether it's MQ or it's Kafka or other streaming types of things. So, the mainframe isn't what most people think it was when they picture the old mainframe. It's a very flexible architecture today because the flexibility comes from the software that you get from the open world, right, and the use of standards. And that's what we've been you know, kind of injecting into the platform. Well, Ross, you know, you can't necessarily say as much as, as I can, part of the liberty of being an analyst is I can give some perspective, but as you look out in the market and you look at all these companies that are doubling down and expanding mm -hmm. their investment, using more uh, mainframe capacity, adding and moving with you from generation to generation, a lot of these companies are those examples because you can be almost certain that over the past decade plus, that CIOs and top IT uh, leaders of almost every company had some either board mandated or some uh, idea when they came in and took that role that they were going to replace or make a change or significantly augment. And what you've actually seen is a lot less of that has happened. And in fact, what has happened has been the growth. growth. And I see it in, you know, with every cycle when I'm reviewing IBM's numbers. So I think that says a lot, in my opinion. You know, another thing you started alluding to is the developer. The, the importance of open ecosystems, the you know, key of developing software that can continue to innovate and enable. Uh, companies to be more uh, on the front foot, running their mainframe and running it, having it run their business. Talk a little bit about how you sort of see the developer ecosystem evolving. I think that there, um, that is one of the things that kind of had to shift for the mainframe to stay really vital. Um, we had IBM and others in the ecosystem had a set of proprietary tools that people used for decades and decades to build their applications. And yet the open world on the cloud really accelerated and came up with a new set of open technologies that developers started to pick up when they were six or eight years old and just doing stuff on their own at home and then in high school and then in college. And those tools were from different worlds. Well, now that we've allowed the adoption of all these open technologies, to be used on the mainframe and for the application development. That's a game changer. And if I look at something that was being done recently with Watson Code Assistant. So Watson Code Assistant is built on a Visual Studio you know, platform, right? Who would have thought that mainframe would be built, uh, interface would be built on a Visual Studio platform in the past? But it is, why? Because more than 50% of the developers of the world have chosen that. And so, what we're doing with that, with Watson Code Assistant, is then we're adding in, we're integrating in a whole bunch of tools. Now, if you hear about Watson Code Assistant for Z, you probably hear about the large language model and the ability to translate COBOL to Java. I would say that that's a, that's a cool thing. It's, it's, it's topical. Gen AI, Gen AI is really exciting. We haven't, we've just scratched the surface of Gen AI. But what, I, what I'm seeing with Watson Code Assistant is we, put, we integrated a set of tools so that you can understand your existing COBOL. Imagine if you had a million lines of code that you were just given as a new employee and, and told to go modify, 
how would you understand a million lines of code quickly? There's tools that can help you do that. They will visualize the code flows and, and, you know, and, and really help you understand. We've got more integrated tools that would then take that and help you refractor some of it. Then if you do want to translate it from COBOL to Java, the large language model can do that. A lot of clients have told me directly, we don't want to get out of COBOL. We just want to optimize it. And they're going to use the large language model to do what? to write the comments better. Large language models can write comments in code better than most humans can. And as an old programmer, um, <laughs> they used to hate writing comments. Now they can be gener you know, generated and they're very, very accurate. So, and then finally, automated testing. Generate the test cases that validate what the changes that you've made and run those test cases. So what I'm seeing in this world is not only move towards open technologies, but making it much more productive for the developer, especially someone new to the platform. Yeah, you're trying to find efficiency in the code. You're trying to enable them to move faster. Yes. Uh, over time, I think this will continue to actually be exponential. I do think, you know, there's certain leaders in this particular space right now that are even talking about, you know, code, um, you know, how much students should be spending on learning it. Mm -hmm. How does speech to text or natural language going to influence it over the long haul? Do we need to learn specific languages or are you going to need to learn more of this kind of semantic interaction with the machine? It's going to get really, really interesting. And I'm not saying it's one way or the other. I think there's a debate to be said that coding is still going to be one of the most invaluable skills on the planet. I also think there's a debate to be said that the way we're going to be able to communicate with the machine naturally might ultimately generate the best code. And I think that's something we can, we can look out for over, over many years. Um, let's talk about AI though. Let's talk a little bit about you know, uh, IBM had made some really exciting advancements in silicon, the, the Telem chip that went into um, the most recent generation of Z. Talk a little bit about kind of the company's thinking about, you know, as a whole about the integration of AI into the mainframe platform. So I think the integration of AI into the hardware and therefore the whole software stack above it is one of the most important new capabilities of the mainframe that I've ever seen in my career. My career spans more than four decades. It is amazing what AI infused into that system is generating now. And I'm talking both traditional AI, so machine learning, right, as well as generative AI. And you're going to see both of those types of AI on the mainframe. And they're very, comp they're, they, do, they do different things, but they're very complementary as well. From a traditional AI point of view, that's where the money is right now, without a doubt, because I'm seeing clients put together their business cases for changing some of their, one of their business processes by infusing AI into it and seeing what that will, what that will do to that business process and its value. So for instance, I think last, I looked last week, we have 178 unique use cases identified by clients so far on mainframes for the use of AI, 178. 30 plus percent of them are in the fraud detection realm. So I'll pick out, there's a large US bank that's uh, doing fraud detection on the mainframe. And they were able to, not able to keep up with doing fraud detection for 100% of their transactions when their transaction volumes peaked at 20 to 25,000 per second. Now with using uh, AI in the mainframe, they can, doesn't matter how high they can scale, they can do the fraud detection. They're, they told me that they're saving more than $20 million a year. So by that calculation, they've paid for all their mainframes that they bought in one year. So that's a pretty high return from a single capability. And I just talked about one use case. And every client that's implemented one use case into production is now working on the second and the third. So I think that AI in the mainframe, in, so injecting it into the business processes to help with better decision making, if you would, business decision making at speed, is going to really revolutionize uh, the mainframe. And, and, and I see that today. Yeah, I had the opportunity to sit down uh, in Davos with Arvind, and I let, he throws around that uh, $4 trillion of productivity mm -hmm. expected by the end of a decade. Right. Um, you know, we do a lot of research on this as well, and, and I actually still think to some extent, as large as a number that is, that is that Arvind gave, it might be understated, be it might be bigger. Yeah. Um, and it's just by seeing how fast it's moving. You know, you gave a for instance, and you're talking about paying for a mainframe with a single use case, but you look across just the financial services sector and the amount of opportunity to take 
fraud and, and AML capabilities that's out. It. That's one use case. Mm -hmm. And you look at every case out there in the transaction volume, it's only going to grow. So the ability to have one, a very resilient piece of hardware in the mainframe, and two, AI that can actually give that level of productivity and efficiency. I always say every, everything about AI is two mm -hmm. things. It's productivity and efficiency. efficiency right? And in your perfect use cases, you get, you get them both together. But the, the speed of which this is going to drive return, it's the most deflationary impact I've ever seen on technology. So the it, companies are going to spend on the tech because the impact it's going to have for growth and for bottom line efficiency is going to be remarkable. And that's what's going on. That's what we're seeing. So, so I want to talk about, by the way, talent and skills a little bit. So okay. we start talking about developers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think, uh, you know, in, in, in this, this mainframe summit, and, I, and hopefully everyone out there is really enjoying this conversation mm -hmm. as much as I am, but, you know, is attraction. So some of the data that, you know, we did a recent survey on skills and, and such, and there was kind of this idea that maybe it's hard to attract people to the mainframe and to the industry, whether it's developers, skills engineers, whatever. Data says that's not true. Data says there is a skills gap. And it says that there's a skills gap across all of technology. Right. And in fact, whether you're an AI and an LLM engineer, whether you're a network architect, a security, you know, you, you know, you're doing perimeter security for, yep. you know, cyber for a, a corporation. It's hard to find people in general. But I am interested with someone like you. Uh, you know, I call you a luminary to this to this industry. Someone's been around. You said four decades. I've been around almost four decades as well in total. Um, but someone that's been around this long, Ross. Um, how do we attract? How do we bring the best? Because I think part of the innovation that's going to drive this productivity and efficiency is going to be about the best talent developing the best mm -hmm. software that is as hybrid and integrated as possible and of course takes advantage of AI. I think that the attraction of talent is very possible and it's happening at many clients. And so, but I do go to some clients that say, I can't find the talent. And we have a set of programs and we say you can, you can Grow it yourself. It could be college grads, could people without a college graduate. We have apprenticeship programs. We can retrain. We have all types of learning paths to take people from whatever, wherever they are to a right level of knowledge to be productive in a client's shop. But also, you can go out into the marketplace and look. There are, there are job boards and other places where there's a lot of mainframe talent around. So I think that the, while there is a talent gap, the talent is out there and it's growing now because of these new or, learning or problems. Or is it skills? I mean, is there... It's, it's, a, it's a skills. Yeah. It's, it's getting the talent to want to come in. And I w I'm going to address the skills piece in a second because yeah. that's like a separate related topic for me. But in terms of finding the people, I think we can do it. We're seeing so many folks coming out of college ready to go into a mainframe career and we're seeing a lot of people taking these other pathways, blue collar type pathways, apprenticeship pathways into, into the mainframe world. We see it in a lot, I see it in a lot of the banks. Again, I'm not going to quote who they are. They can do their own you know, press on this, um, but I see them being very successful in building programs where they're, they were five years ago, they were really worried about the future of the talent pool. Now they're not worried at all because they can, they can bring people on and get them up to speed. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult Ross, to try to drive talent to any field right now. And so the ability, I think, to get the best to come in and see that there's a chance to play with AI here. Mm -hmm. There's a chance to be part of LLMs yes, and, and, and the development of generative AI tools. There's a chance to even play in silicon engineering. I mean, what we've talked about today mm -hmm. with you know chip architecture, right. generative AI and code assistance. I mean, this is cool. I mean, can I say that? Sure, can absolutely. And cool? also, I think some people, when they come in, they realize that, the, you know, they're working on helping to sustain part of the world's economy, right? So you're working on some pretty big um, platforms, right, that, and processes that support our nation's economy, the world's economy, and I think that there's some things that, that are exciting about that as well. So leading edge technology, in making a big difference on the world. I know, I know it's a little bit, uh, you know, maybe cliche to say it in the mainframe world, Ross, but you know, next time you're at your Starbucks and you scan that uh, credit card and that That's payment it. goes through securely and you know that you got your coffee <laughs> and your credit card wasn't compromised in the process, you can thank a mainframe. Thank you, mainframe. <laughs> you can thank That's a mainframe great. somewhere out there. That's All great. Right. So Linux One, um, 
10 years it's going on it's just hit 10 years almost not 10 okay. years almost it's going um, on. so linux one is our linux only mainframe right and when i when i first put that out there um it really was because of a number of clients wanted something that wasn't called a mainframe that they could put in their data centers it was the name that they really want the name change. But we focus on that space because you can run Linux right next to ZOS on any IBM C system. But some clients said they wanted a standalone set of Linux systems. And what's been interesting over this 10 years is we now have more than 100 new clients that have never owned a, a, a traditional mainframe with ZOS. They only own the Linux One and the Linux One capabilities. And that is growing like wildfire. Again, massive consolidation. Some of it really sparked by sustainability needs. And it wasn't just that their corporate ESG goals were out and IT had to reduce so much of their electrical footprint and things like that. Um, there's, there's many companies where their data centers are out of space and, and there's no more power that they can get into them. So in order for them to continue to grow, they had to move to a much more efficient system. And the Linux One system is way more efficient than a comparative Intel cluster. In fact, probably 75% less electrical uh, need usage uh, for comparable large systems. And that turns out to be a big deal, again, in the sustainability world. A lot of world. procurement com uh, groups and companies are very yeah. focused on that metric right yeah. now. Last three years, this has come up. Before that, we were we had a very efficient system for a long time. Yep. Uh, it just wasn't on that top list of things that people were looking at. So I think that uh, I'm really happy with where we are with Linux One. We are now doing some things uh, in the system just for the Linux side, larger memory, things like that. It'll just be used for you know, Linux applications. And um, again, we've got clients that have more than a million Linux MIPS already on their floors. That to me says something in the world has changed and that Linux is Linux is Linux. Regardless if you run on Power or ARM or x86, right? Or the Z architecture, it's Linux. But you get something more, you inherit something from the system if you run it on a Z. You inherit that scalability, that IO capability, the security, right? You inherit a lot. And so add sustainability in with that, add in large scale consolidation and simplification. I think we're gonna see this continue to grow and it's growing like that. Yeah, as my, uh, my esteemed uh, 6.5 co-host Patrick Moore likes to say, it's more than a bag of parts. Mm -hmm. It is, it is a system that was built on a lot of best of breed from the Z designed for that Linux group, which by the way, which was designed for a certain audience of people who still wanted all the resiliency and scalability right. and, and performance that you get out of a mainframe, but had someone that they weren't allowed to tell them they were buying mainframe. That's right, that's so, right, that's right. So, so. <laughs> but luckily, you know, I'd say in the last four to five years, um, mainframe hasn't become maybe the, the bad word it was uh, a decade or more ago. I see a lot of companies' strategies clearly have embraced the mainframe for the strategic future. I think AI is one of those reasons that they're seeing that value. And I just want to touch on one other point, if I may. Yeah. So we talk about the need for skills. Well, the need for skills is because the mainframe in many ways to be a system program, programmer on it, system administrator, it's different than those other systems. Why is it different? Just because it grew up in a different time. Well, I've got a major project underway that's going to simplify the system and use as many open standards as we can so that people that run large x86 clusters or are used to a cloud operating environment can use all those same tools and same skills now to bring up and run a mainframe. And you're gonna, you're gonna be seeing that in the next generation. You heard that here, a little product teasing here from Ross Mori. It's, it's interesting that you pointed that out though because I think the moment that the mainframe went from being a little bit of a you know, quiet room conversation to back in the in the, in the mainstream to being mm -hmm. popular conversation was when that and moment yeah, hit. Right. Meaning when people said, oh, it's hybrid and mainframe, hybrid cloud, it's hybrid yeah. security and mainframe, it's AI and mainframe, it's open APIs and mainframe, is that yes, you can be closed for things that are require that resilient security and you can make sure that you've cut it off from the world and the risk that the cloud can provide, that the cloud has. But at the same time, for those other things where cloud makes sense, that integration has been yes. built. And I think once that happened, that uh, that you know sort of stereotype you talked about yeah. went away. And I think now everybody's okay with it and uh, deservedly so. Yeah. Well, think about a world where everybody's into containers. At least a lot of people are into containers, right? Going you to can Kubernetes. run, you can yeah, Kubernetes, and you can run that on Linux on Z. 
you can run a full Red Hat OpenShift stack inside of a ZOS address space. I mean, you can do things today that I think people wouldn't even have considered. They would have, wouldn't have even thought about this five to seven years ago. Now there's so much you can do with open technologies integrating them in. So again, I think the future is ours. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's wrap up with the future. Um, it's been great chatting. Thanks so much for being the opening keynote here at the, at the Mainframe Summit. Uh, Ross, it's always fun to sit down with you, but uh, where does this all go? How, how, what's the next wave? Uh, I know you've, you just teased a little bit of product mm -hmm. innovation. How does the Mainframe evolve from here? Well, I think, um, I think one of the ways we do it is we continue to expand the scope of use cases that, are, that our AI technology is focused on. We're not trying to be AI for everything in the world. We're trying to be very specific about our clients and the large enterprises they run and the, and the business processes that, the, that all that code you know, personifies and what could we do there. And so I think we're going we're gonna to bump up the capabilities of the AI hardware, both on the processor and in the system, and so that you can do even more traditional AI use cases, and you can do generative AI use cases, and you're going to see the emergence of something we call ensemble AI, which is many clients using both traditional and generative together around a business problem. Powerful. If I was going to make a guess, I would have said IBM would be doing more hybrid cloud, <laughs> more AI. <laughs> Ross Mori, thanks so much for joining me here today. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks, Daniel. It's great. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone, thanks so much for tuning in here at the Mainframe Summit brought to you by the 6.5. Subscribe and tune in to all the great sessions here at the Mainframe Summit. But for this one, for this opening keynote, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you all later.